Hello, my name is Caleb Appleton, and I will be a senior at A&M Consolidated High School this year. I spent the last summer working in the Electromagnetics and Microwave Laboratory under the direction of Dr. Gregory Huff, and I took and applied basic antenna and waveguide principles to develop an effective yet inexpensive antenna called the Cantenna. Okay, now I'd like to show you a few uh, slides as an overview of the summer, just describing what I did and what I learned from the experience. Here's a quick overview of what I'll be covering. I'll be introducing the Cantenna, reviewing the pr basic principles of circular waveguides, detailing the design process of the Cantenna, and relaying to you the simulations and experiments and the results of those simulations and experiments. As an introduction to the Cantenna, basically it's a low-cost uh, antenna range booster. It has various uses. Um, you can use it to boost your home's Wi-Fi uh, radius or increase the Wi-Fi range on your computer. Um, on the left of your screen right now is a commercial version of the Cantenna, which sells for between $50 and $100, about 10 to 20 times the cost of what it would cost you to manufacture your own. And on the right is a homemade Cantenna similar to the one we made. This is the circular waveguide. The circular waveguide is extremely efficient with low loss and high predictability. Another advantage of the circular waveguide is that you can tone it to operate at any frequency using a series of equations that I'll show you on the next slide. The circular waveguide allows waves to propagate as long as they are above the cutoff wavelength. On this slide there's um, a few properties of the wave, circular waveguide that we had to find and calculate in order to ensure that our cantina operated in the way that we wanted to. First, we have the wave number, which is a measurement of the amount of phase or number of waves within a unit distance. This value is given in radians per meter and can thus be used as a conversion factor to deduce the amount of phase over a set distance. Second, we had to calculate the cutoff wave number. The cutoff wave number tells the minimum wave number for the wave to still be able to propagate within the circular waveguide. Think of when you're driving through a tunnel and you lose radio reception. This is due to the fact that the wave number is too low for the wave to propagate within the tunnel. Thus, the wave can no longer reach the antenna. We will use this number and the wave number to calculate the guided wavelength. The guided wavelength is a function of the operating wave number and the cutoff wave number, thus generating a wave number that is longer than it would be in free space. This apparent difference can be explained by imagining waves at a beach. When you look at the waves from an angle, they appear to be moving faster than if you looked at the waves from straight on. This is the same within the circular waveguide. The guided wavelength is actually longer than the wavelength would be in free space. We then divided the wavelength by four, the guided wavelength by four, to get an optimal position of the, of the probe. This ensures that any electromagnetic energy that escapes past the probe is reflected by the back wall so that it rejoins the other electromagnetic energy in phase. This is also known as the short circuit position. To design the cantina, we measured using calipers every variable within the can and the type in connector, and we imported those measurements into Ansoft HFSS, which is a electromagnetic field simulating software. We also used the calculated probe position that we found on the last slide and plugged it into the simulation as well. Within Ansoft, we also simulated the impact of the probe height and length to optimize impedance at a frequency of 2.442 gigahertz. Now on your screen are two cross sections of the cantina that we used. All the variables that we used in the simulations are labeled as well as the values for those variables. So this is the cantina that we constructed. Um, as you can see, we have a 64 ounce pineapple juice can. If you look on the inside, you can see the copper wire which we soldered to the type N connector which I'm currently holding in my right hand. Um, attached to that type N connector is a 50 centimeter pigtail cable that goes into a Rawlink wireless USB card and that attaches to your computer and it allows you to boost your Wi-Fi range and strength. Okay, so now for the results of our simulations and measurements. Um, on the top right of the screen is an Agilent Technologies network analyzer. This device allows us to measure some of the properties of a constructed antenna. On the bottom left is a graph depicting the simulated versus measured VSWR, or voltage standing wave ratio. And in that graph, the ISM band is highlighted. That band goes from 2.440 gigahertz to 2.484 gigahertz. 
And on the bottom right is a graph comparing the simulated versus measured impedance. Once again, the measured impedance was measured using the Agilent Technologies Network Analyzer. And as you can see, there's a strong correlation between the simulated and measured data. Now appearing on your screen is an overview of the experiments and measurements we took of the constructed Cantenna. Set up an ad hoc network between two netbook PCs that allowed the two PCs to communicate with each other as well as a, allowing us to measure the power and signal strength between the two PCs. Two Cantenas were attached to the laptops using the items that you saw and what we did is we set up a circle of a radius of 5.65 meters in the lobby of the Zachary Engineering Building. One cantina was mounted at the center of that circle on a tripod, and the other cantina was moved about the circumference of the circle, and measurements were taken every 15 degrees was in dBm. That data was then converted to dBi and was compared to our simulated results, as well as the results that were measured on the rotating pedestal in the anechoic chamber. For the anechoic chamber test, we also used a standard gain horn, which allowed us to eliminate a variable in the equation because its gain is known, and it allowed us to get the gain from the antenna in a near ideal environment. Now appearing on your screen is the results from those three tests, the simulated gain, the experimental gain in the lobby of the Zachary building, and the anechoic chamber gain. Once again, I'm Caleb Appleton, and I'm going to be a senior at A&M Consolidated High School. I would like to thank Dr. Gregory Huff for allowing me to use the different facilities this summer, such as the Anechoic Chamber, as well as Sean Goldberg and Robert Baxter for helping with my experiments.